Today I'm going to present a joint work with my advisor, Sanjeev Varora, uh, an expansion learning rate schedule for deep learning. So there already exists lots of exotic learning rate schedules in deep learning, such as uh, cosine, triangular, and cyclical learning rates. And uh, our expansion growing learning rate schedule is an extreme example of this, which becomes possible with the presence of batch normalization. The goal of, the goal of this study the goal of studying this expansion learning rate schedule is to better understand the complex interplay happening in practice between the modern architecture and the bunch of tricks such as BN, WDK, and LRDK. So let's start. So let me first convince you that uh, the expansion growing learning rate actually works in practice. So in the right figure, in the figure uh, on the right, you can see this straight line, which is uh, straight green line, which is the exponential growing learning rate. And the orange line is the normal square of the, uh, normal square of the w weights in some convolutional layer in the neural network. Uh, precisely, it's the pre 32. So both of them grows exponentially at the same exponent. And meanwhile, the training accuracy and test accuracy increases and then converges. So it might look familiar to you if you have played with CFAT10. This is exactly the curve you will see with the uh, batch normalization and weight decay and with constant learning rate. Okay. So here, uh, you can just try this expansion learning rate uh, on ResNet without twisting any um, structure of the network. However, uh, you need to keep the output layer fixed. And I will explain this in the next slide. So the reason we need to keep output, output layer fixed is because we need the so-called scale invariance property of the network. Formally, it means that uh, if you scale the parameters of the network by constant, then the network doesn't change in function space. And uh, a direct consequence of this is that if you scale the parameters, the loss will also not change. And a source of this scale invariance is mainly uh, the popular and famous batch normalization, which is almost ubiquitous in machine learning, uh, in deep learning. So this is the definition, and you can see that uh, the output of the batch norm layer uh, is invariant to the scaling of this uh, weight, of this incoming weight. And if the parameters of the output layer namely after all the parameters after the last being are fixed, then the whole net is scale invariant. And the recent work by Hofer et al. shows that fixing the last layer randomly doesn't harm the performance. So in the rest part of the talk, we assume the last layer are all fixed. So now we are ready to give our main result. So it says that SGD with momentum and weight decay and constant learning rate is equivalent to SGD with momentum and, and with an exponential learning rate, where this exponent is decided together by uh, the gamma, which is momentum, and weight decay lambda, and the, const uh, and the original learning rate eta. So here we implicitly require, assume that the product of eta and lambda is not very large, such that the uh, alpha exists. And this is always true in practice, actually, because uh, in practice, the uh, lambda is very, very small. It's in the order of 10 to the minus 4. Okay. So why is this scale invariance so special? Uh, well, we have this following lemma, and which contains all the properties we, we are going to use about uh, in this talk. The first thing is that the gradient is, al is always perpendicular to the weight itself. Uh, and the second property is that if you scale up the weight, the parameters, then the gradients will be scaled down correspondingly by the same constant, as shown in this figure. And the proof is very easy. It's just by chain rule. And you can check it by yourself. And the property, too, has been observed by lots of papers. And for example, the original BN paper argues that uh, moreover, larger weights will lead to smaller gradients, which stabilize the parameter growth. And the second property is first used to analy 
analyze the transition with batch norm. In our previous paper uh, with Kai Feng Lu, who, is a, who was a summer intern in Princeton. So basically, we show that batch norm allows SGD to convert to first order stationary point with any fixed learning rate on some mild smoothness assumption. So now we will start with the equivalence uh, of the momentum free case. And I hope this, this simple and I hope this simple proof could convince you that this exponential learning rate actually works. And then we will move to the general case with momentum. So uh, as I previous said, these two weights are with same direction but with different scaling. So they correspond to the same network now, and after one step of GD, they correspond to different networks. And the easiest way to fix this is just to, to scale the learning rate by C square. And after one step of GD update, they still remain the same. So in other words, we have a commutative diagram, uh, which means this scaling is uh, commutable with uh, commutative with this GD update. And to simplify notation, we define these following maps. Basically, we call the pair theta, t, and eta a state of the training algorithm. And we view um, each step of the training algorithm a map, a mapping from a state to another state. So we have these following states. And we can rewrite this diagram in a compact way. OK. And we call this pi 1c and pi 2c squared equivalent scaling because um, First, it will not change the current network in function space. Second, it will not change the future network in function space after a sequence of GD updates. So basically, we can free insert and uh, delete such equivalent scalings in our algorithm. OK, so now we define the uh, update of GD updates with weight decay, uh, which is this GD row t. So when row is equal to 1, it's just a normal GD update. And when row is equal to 1 minus lambda times eta, it's corresponding to um, GD, update, GD update with weight decay. And we have this lemma, which says that you can re uh, represent GD row t uh, as a composition of the basic maps we defined, about, uh, we de defined previously. OK, so now we are ready to prove the main theorem in the case of momentum-free uh, SGD. So the proof is by picture. It's actually quite simple. Because the uh, commutative property, we, can, uh, we, have this, um, we have this plot. And the left-hand side of this equation is basically this black trajectory, uh, which you which means you first do deals, deal with all the um, GD update with weight decay, and then you question. Oh, sorry. sorry. Okay. Sorry. Two minutes. I no, actually, I start late. I start late. Uh, and the pink path is the right hand side which is the desired trajectory. Here we use the property that's a composition of pink and uh, of purple, and uh, yellow map is a red map, which is a scaling. OK? So for the case of SGD with momentum, it's almost similar. We want to find such an exponential linear schedule. But this form is hard to deal with, because we have uh, this uh, linear composition, linear combination of past weights. So we rewrite the definition of uh, SGD with momentum in this way. And we have this theorem. The proof is almost the same. We have a bunch of uh, maps. And now we extend the definition of states to four tuples. And uh, so we can, again, we can write the GD row t in this way, which looks very complicated. But when we do composition of multiple GD row t, it doesn't make it doesn't make things more complicated because this, um, these blue terms cancels with each other, and these brown terms is equivalent scaling, which could be ignored. And the only thing left is this um, red scaling and the green GDI. So we can extend our result to the case of um, step decay linear schedule. 
which has multiple phase. And we show that even in this case, um, our algorithm um, simulates the weight decay very well with a step decay linear schedule. So the red line is our algorithm, and the green line is the behavior of weight decay. So, yeah, so I guess I will just skip these things. So this is a very interesting experimental phenomenon. If you have time, please check our paper on archive. So, uh, so how do we understand this exponential linear rate via canonical optimization framework? So here, by saying canonical, for canonical optimization framework, I mean to, I'm referring to um, the way of analysis where you, where you basically assume each update of GD will decrease the function value, and assuming the smoothness is smaller than uh, 2 over linear rate. However, in this case, scaling invariance loss is always non-convex and non-smooth around origin. And we don't have weight decay because we show that um, SGD will always increase the norm, so the smoothness is still lower bounded from zero. But when you have, but when you have weight decay, um, it's quite different. In the case of gradient flow, weight decay will not change the trajectory, but it will only exponentially scale the gradient because it will only make the um, norm of the parameters smaller and smaller and it will have no uh, tangential speed. And due to the equivalence to the exponential learning rate, one cannot track this process for very long when weight decay is turned on. And in other, in other words, we shouldn't use gradient flow to analyze the um, behavior of gradient descent in the case of weight, weight decay. And okay, so the conclusion. So we give a rigorous proof for the equivalence of weight decay and exponential learning rate. And we also give a non convergence result, which I don't have time to talk about. So to fully understand the efficacy of such an exponential learning rate schedule, we need new tools beyond the canonical optimization uh, framework. OK, that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Joan. So hi, everyone. So my name is uh, John Zarka. I'm uh, currently a PhD student at uh, ENS in Paris under the supervision of uh, Stéphane Mala. And today I'm going to briefly present you our recent work on a deep network classification by scattering and homotopy dictionary learning made two, with two other PhD students, Louis Thierry and uh, Thomas Angles. So what was the goal of the work? The goal of uh, the work was to construct a deep uh, neural network model which is mathematically interpretable reaching accuracy of convolutional neural networks on complex classification problems like ImageNet. By uh, mathematically interpretable, we mean that we understand the role of all the weights uh, across the different layers and their mathematical properties in the pipeline which transforms the inputs into the features, which is not the case for standard CNNs. So to achieve this, we stack two networks playing uh, different roles. The first network is the scattering network whose role is to reduce geometric variability of inputs, which may not be informative like translation, rotation, and deformations, by linearizing the action of those groups. So this network is uh, unsupervised, and its weights are predefined uh, wavelet filters. The second network is a sparse coding network, which uh, represents an unrolled iterative sparse coding algorithm. There is uh, supervision in this, in this network, but supervision is reduced to the learning of a single dictionary matrix in which we compute uh, a sparse code. The choice of the sparse coding algorithm used, which is a nomotopy sparse coding algorithm I will define later, has been uh, optimized in order to converge exponentially and hence reduce the numbers of layers needed. The result, the main result we obtain is that with this very structured CNN model, by classifying on the sparse code, we are able to beat AlexNet on uh, ImageNet. So let's have a look first at the first network, which is a scattering network. Naturally, the first kind of variability which we want to reduce is geometric intra-class variabilities known a priori, like translation, rotation, and small deformations, which may not be class informative. For instance, on MNIST, if you translate or deform a bit a digit, it's still going to remain the same digit. So we want to linearize those variabilities and leave it to the classifier to make a linear projection to compute invariance. And the way to linearize those groups is to use a multi-scale representation 
separating the signal variation at multiple scales, which is exactly what the wavelet transform does. It computes low frequency information by convolving the input signal X with a Gaussian kernel of phi J of scale 2 power J. And the high frequency information at different scales and orientation by convolving X with oriented and scaled wavelets uh, psi J theta. And if we implement the wavelet transform with a, with a filter bank, we see that it can be represented as a network with uh, J layers, where at each step you convolve the previous uh, layer low frequency channel with a with small low pass and oriented band pass filters. The so problem with uh, the wavelet transform representation is that because you have to convolve with low scale wavelets to preserve high frequency uh, information, you only get translation linearization up to very small scales and not up to a bigger scale. And to get this linearization at a bigger scale, we need to convolve the X convolved with psi J theta again with a Gaussian kernel phi J. And the problem is that the wavelets are orthogonal to the kernel, so this convolution gives zero. So if we want X convolved with psi J theta interact with phi J, we need to introduce a pointwise linearity uh, like ROLU or modulus and compute rho of X convolved with psi J theta convolved with phi J. But um, once again, we lose high frequencies of rho X convolved with psi J theta, so we need to recover them with levels. So we can iterate this process, but in practice, order two with two non-linearities sufficient, and that's exactly the scattering transform uh, representation uh, we use here. And like for the wavelet transform, we can view it at, uh, as a depth J network with only two band pass filters. Uh, and so by construction, it, linear, it linearizes translation up to uh, scale two power J and small deformations. It just performs well compared to CNNs, on, on simple data sets like MNIST or CIFA, where most of the, most of the variabilities stem, stem from translation and deformation. On MNIST, for instance, where intra-class variability is almost purely reduced to translation, small deformation and rotation, um, scattering transform is even state of the art. But on, on a complex data set like ImageNet, where there are much more intra-class variability and not purely geometric, there is a 20% gap with AlexNet in terms of performance. So the question is, what is missing? And what we showed in this work is what is missing here is supervision and learning uh, class informative patterns. The rational being that now that we have reduced intra-class variability with the scattering, we can try to learn a dictionary uh, D of patterns, compute a sparse code in the dictionary, and classify on the sparse code. It will not be possible directly on raw inputs, which have too much variability. And so computing the sparse code alpha D in a dictionary D amounts to solving this uh, L1 minimization problem, you know, here with a quadratic regression term and the L1 constraint of amplitude lambda star. And we learn D using the task-driven dictionary learning framework whereby we minimize over D, but as well lambda star, and of course the classifier words W, the so cross entrepilos of our classifier on the sparse code. So in order to learn the dictionary D, we need to compute the sparse code and the function of D and uh, differentiate it with respect to D in order to do the gradient descent. And one simple way to do it is to use an iterative sparse coding algorithm and roll it and simply do gradient descent with back, with back prop in the network to differentiate the sparse code. And uh, one famous iterative uh, sparse coding algorithm, ISTA, which is a proximal gradient algorithm whose iteration you, you, you see here with stepwise epsilon, and its acceleration phi star are generic iterative sparse coding algorithm, but converge too slowly, and as such would require too many layers when on all typically uh, like more than 30. That's why, when we, why we, that's why we used instead a, a homotopy sparse coding algorithm called the iterative so, soft thresholding continuation algorithm, or ISTC, whose iteration here look uh, very similar, you see uh, below, but which in fact behave very differently because of its geometry decreasing thresholds lambda n, whereas for E star the, th the threshold uh, amplitude is always the same. And this uh, sparse coding algorithm has an exponential convergence properties and allows us to compute the sparse code with typically only 12 to 16 layers. And um, as we see, as we, you can see in this figure, we compute iteration of this algorithm with a network which has a soft 
thresholding non-linearities, side connections from the input, and like I said, uh, geometrically decreasing uh, thresholds. So formally, the theorem we have on the, on, on the convergence is that under the assumption mu s below one half, which is an assumption very common in, in, in sparse coding, um, where mu is the current of the dictionary and s the sparsity of the L0 problem solution, which is the same as the L1 problem solution in this case, we get that this algorithm converges exponentially quickly towards the L0 solution when using those geometrically decreasing thresholds with a certain condition you, you see above on the geometric step gamma of uh, lambda n. And in fact, when looking at the proof, the mu s below one half bound is very brutal. It's a very brutal uh, bound, and even if not verified in practice, we still get the, the convergence. And this algorithm, like all homotopy algorithms, has an optimization path which is uh, opposite to ISTA uh, and FISTA since it goes from a very sparse initial solution towards a less sparse but optimal one like we see here on the graph uh, uh, below on the left. Similarly to matching, portion, matching pursuit algorithm, by progressively decreasing the Lagrange multiplier lambda n, while it is in fact the opposite for Einstein phi star, like you can see on the right uh, below, which computes a first non-sparse code progressively uh, sp sparsified through iterated uh, thresholding. So now that we have all the ingredients, we can get back to the full pipeline. So first we start by uh, computing a scattering transform. We then use a linear operator L to reduce dimensionality. We compute the sparse code in a learned dictionary D with a ISTC, and we classify uh, on the code using an MLP classifier. And by using this pipeline, we are basically the only thing we learn before the classifier is a single dictionary matrix D. We beat AlexNet since we get close to 81% top five accuracy versus 79% for AlexNet, and 59% um, percent top one accuracy versus um, 56.5 for AlexNet. And it improves scattering performance by more than 20% and even 30% uh, with a linear classifier. So I give you a few more information on, on the pipeline here very quickly. The, the linear dimensionality reduction operator L is learned but can be removed without much drop in accuracy. And what we observed in reality is that it was basically decorating the scattering representation and could be replaced by PCA. Learning is performed by SGG, and the ESTC sparse coding network is for the moment a one by one convolutional network, but we are currently extending it to larger kernel sizes using convolutional sparse coding. And uh, we get sparse codes of around 3% sparsity in a dictionary G of depth uh, 2048, and we use a single batch norm before the classifier. There is no batch norm inside the scattering of the sparse coding uh, network. And interestingly, what we observe is that the sparse code we get removes a lot of information on the input in the scattering space since uh, roughly 50% of the input energy is removed. So now the question and we, uh, we will be working on is to understand what kind of patterns are learned by D. Are there conjunction of patterns which are specific to certain classes? And what can we see that a lot of information is, is removed. So what kind of information is removed? So that's what we want to do now to look a bit more in 2D. And finally, an interesting observation on D is that it projects a sparse code, which are high dimensional, typically around um, 2000, into lower dimensional spaces, which with, dim with dimension around 2 to 100, um, uh, with those space remaining separated, even though they are not sparse anymore, since classification on, on D alpha instead of alpha barely drops. It thus indicates that D is also optimized to, to preserve the discriminative uh, directions. So thank you very much for your attention. The paper is available on archive. And uh, the scattering transform was performed using the Kimasio software, which is available on, Git on GitHub, and which I invite you to use if you want to do uh, scattering. Thank you. A good early afternoon, everyone. My name is Stanislav Fort. I'm a PhD student at Stanford University with uh, Professor Surya Genguli. And I'll be presenting my work on the large-scale structure of neural network loss landscapes I performed when I was an AI resident in Google Research, together with my amazing collaborator, Stanislav Jastrzewski, who's currently a postdoc at NYU. The talk is based on these papers, shown there in an anonymous submission I can't de-anonymize here, uh, but the blue one is the um, main one. Okay, let's dive uh, straight, uh, straight in. 
So a neural network uh, in a classification task maps an input x uh, using a functional ansatz f parameterized by a parameters w into a vector of logits y, probabilities p, and then a loss l that characterizes how unhappy we are with the solution the neural network uh, produced. I will focus in this talk on the connection between the L, which is the loss, and the W vector specifying the trainable parameters of the neural network. Now we can imagine a scalar function L, which is the loss, uh, when we pass the whole data set through the network given a parameter set W, and it's a scalar function in a very high dimensional uh, real space of dimension D. The dimension is typically 10 to the 5 at least for small networks and goes to all the way to 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 for huge networks we currently work with. So it's a very high dimensional space. Uh, diagrammatically, we can initialize somewhere in this landscape, which is the purple dot in my visualization, and then using gradient descent, we slide, hopefully, to a global minimum somewhere in that space. But this is a 2D representation and a smooth representation of, very, of a very complicated problem that's very high dimensional, and we know very little about the actual function we optimize over. So in this talk, I will talk about our work uh, that we did to characterize the large-scale structure of the landscape we actually optimize over when we train a neural network. There are three surprising simplicities of the network of the lost landscape that people noticed in independent papers and never kind of put together into one single model. And I'll discuss all of them and how we put them into a single phenomenological model we built. The first one is that there exist long directions in the landscape along which you can walk a long way in the weight space without encountering any high loss areas. There is a second observation that minima in that space are distributed densely everywhere and uh, you can hit them reliably with low dimensional or random sections of that space. A third observation is that independent minima are connected on low loss paths that are hard to find at random, but you can find them easily using gradient descent that sniffs out where the path exists. So we will build a network, we will build a model of the landscape that incorporates all of those observations together and hopefully makes new predictions that we verify in real networks. Simplicity number one, long directions. This has been noticed for the first time in Goodfellow 2014 that if you connect the initialization to the optimum you reached in the weight space, you don't encounter any high loss areas on the way. It's a nice monotonically decreasing function, even though the gradient descent could wiggle in all the directions you had in that space. What you're looking at right now is a real landscape of a CNN trained on CIFAR 10, and the 2D plane we're visualizing is defined by the blue point, uh, which is the origin of the landscape of the weight space, where all the weights are zero, and the two green dots, which are the two solutions we optimize to independently from two random initializations, which are the purple, the pink dots there. You can see that the, the dark green regions are the ones of high accuracy, and you can see we could walk a long way along these directions, and we would not encounter any high loss areas. So it's a very low frequency landscape along these low dimensional cuts. Those are the directions we uh, traverse when we're optimizing actually from the initializations. They were mainly radial in the direction, meaning along all the, along, in a way that increases all the weights kind of by same scale factor. They were wiggling to the sides as well, but mainly radial. And we could continue for double the distance and we would still stay in a real uh, nice solution with high accuracy. Okay, simplicity number two. Optimization works even on a random low dimensional cuts you put into the weight space. This has been noticed in a cool paper by Uber AI Labs two years ago, and it works as follows. In the lost landscape, you can take a point P characterizing a particular solution, let's say initialization, uh, not trained, and you put a random purple hyperplane there specified by the span of a few vectors, a small number of vectors, low dimensional hyperplane. If you were to optimize in the full space, there would be a green path, you could move in all of them at once, but we force the optimization to stay on this low dimensional cut. It could be a thousand dimensional random hyperplane in a million dimensional space. And it has been noticed that if you optimize uh, on planes of a certain dimension and above, and the dimension, the critical dimension is given by the data set and the architecture you use, you optimize reliably wherever the hyperplane is and uh, whatever the dimension is given is bigger than a certain threshold. And to us that suggests that a distributed, that a manifold of solutions in that space is distributed and dense enough that we can hit it reliably with these low dimensional hyperplanes and also its dimensionality has to be at least the co-dimension of this, uh, the, the complement of the dimension of the hyperplane uh, with the full space. Otherwise, we would not be able to geometrically hit it reliably on these random sections. Uh, simplicity number three, independent optima are connected, but it's hard to find these connectors. So there's been a lot of uh, interesting papers that observe this, and what we did was very simple. We took two optima, which are the blue dots, 
on the ends, independently optimized to from random initializations, put a, a linear path in between them, and put up hyperplanes of dimension d minus one along the way at linear intervals. At each hyperplane, we would initialize the red dot, which is the intersection of the hyperplane, with uh, the linear interpolation, and optimize independently in each hyperplane on its own. No restrictions on the length of the path, no nothing, not, nothing like that. But it turned out the path we get is basically two linear segments, as shown here. The matrix on the left is the cosines between the deviations, which are these uh, brown uh, segments. And you see that until a half of the path elapses, you're kind of moving on a linear segment in a certain direction, and after the half, it's another linear segment of a different direction, and in the middle, they meet. On top of that, we looked at a functional form of the function interpolated along the way, and it's similar to one end until the half, and another end after the half. Yes? Independently, there's no connection between the optimization but in. That that there's a memory of the starting point. Oh, no, not really. It could also mean that there is a geometrically persistent structure that these things are discovering. So if there's an underlying way that the hyperplanes, let's say there's a low loss area here, you would expect that these hyperplanes would be, the optimizations would be drawn to them independently. So that is our conclusion that there's a geometric structure that these hyperplane cuts are discovering. It's not unique, but it's unique enough to lead to high cosines. But it's very ununique, but it's in a similar direction. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's a very fair point. So these vectors you would get could lead to very different positions, but they would have high cosine, and given that it's a very high dimensional space, it shows very persistent geometrical structure they're uncovering along the way. Okay, uh, great question, thanks a lot. And if you were to visualize the same lost landscape cut along this path, stitching together triangles going from the origin to the linear segments of this path we build up, you would see that you can connect the two optima on a high accuracy uh, flat piece of the landscape. And on top of that, that thing wouldn't be a linear uh, tube or a tunnel of, a, of one dimension only, but we would see that it's a very persistent long thing going in the radial direction far. So that's been interesting. So we thought how to model this in a single model. And our proposal was to model the low loss manifold of the uh, landscape, yes? Oh, I see, okay. Low loss manifold of the landscape as a unit of high dimensional wedges that radiate from the origin and uh, look kind of like pizza slices, uh, uh, assuming two pi, uh, pi half angle each and then kind of radiating out from the origin. So we see, we see a, an example of two solutions, the red solution and the blue solution we would independently optimize to. And these live on the uh, red submanifold and the blue submanifold. These submanifolds are really high dimensional, so we don't we cannot show that on these uh, diagrams. But you can imagine kind of the thick line around is very high dimensional subspace, and they radiate uh, radially from the origin. They intersect. So at these intersections, they provide bridges to build the connectors between optima uh, that we can utilize uh, when we build these connectors. But if we were to move linearly between them on the black path would leave the uh, low loss manifold and incur a high loss cost in the middle. But we can build a connector that takes these two linear segments along the uh, manifolds and bridges the two manifolds together. Now, this model we built using some observations people made before and observations we made ourselves, but does it make any new predictions? The first one is that the midpoint that we circled uh, on the, using the green circle should be doubly as constrained in its kind of wiggle room than the individual manifolds. And that's what we observe when we actually step over the linear path. This is the number of short directions using a certain threshold for what we call short. In the weight space, as we step along the connected path, the optimized path, and the x-axis is the interpolation coefficient. And in the middle, you see that the number of directions you, can, you cannot wiggle in much is much higher than on the edges. It's not exactly double the number as we predicted, but around between two and three. The second prediction I want to present is that you don't have to connect two optima only at once. You can predict, uh, connect m optima together on a m minus, minus one dimensional manifold. So you can go from a single linear tunnel to m tunnel instead. And we constructed those between 11 optima at most. And we had a 10 dimensional hypersurface slightly deviating from the linear span of these things that had valid solutions on the whole surface where we can step between and see that all of them have low loss. Okay, so in summary, we built a phenomenological model of the lost landscape, of the low loss attractor of the lost landscape, uh, to be precise. It incorporated the distributed nature of the landscape and the connectivity we observe in real landscapes. We made new predictions and verified that they actually appear in real networks as well, and that give us confidence we captured something real about a landscape. 
And this has huge consequences for ensembling we explored in a follow-up paper. Those are the references I had in the uh, talk, and thank you very much.